You are listening to a sermon from River Community Church in Prairieville, Louisiana. Hear the word of the Lord. A Shigion of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. O Lord my God, in, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, then let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Selah. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it, return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts. O righteous God, my shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. So we come to Psalm 7 this morning, and uh, this is not a great text for a Mother's Day sermon. <laughs> so if that's what you were expecting today, I'm I'm sorry. Rather, Psalm 7 is an extended reflection upon God's justice. We might even call it a litany for justice. And in it, God wants us to find comfort and the knowledge that God is a God of justice. Now, that right there is an odd thing to say. We're used to thinking about God's mercy as something to take comfort in, but not His justice. God's love? Absolutely. But God's justice is a harder thing for us to wrap our heads around as something we should find comfort in. After all, isn't God's justice our big problem? Isn't His justice against our own sin reason to fear him isn't it what sends people to hell for all eternity we associate the day of judgment the day when god's justice is finally executed on the world as a day of fire and terror and wrath it's a scary thought But here we must come back to the world that we actually live in. And not the world we think we live in, but the world that we actually live in, because we must realize that throughout the course of human history, injustice has been the norm. The Western world we live in, a world in which the rule of law is prized, where ethical behavior is important, this world is incredibly exceptional. Even with its problems, Western society is just and well-governed and ethical compared to the vast majority of societies and governments throughout the history of the world. 
understand, my friends, that man in his natural state is a tyrant and a beast. The trend of human history is injustice and cruelty. Corruption has been the defining trait of government since government first came on the scene. And in the majority world today, bribery, backroom deals, and personal favors are what grease the wheels of government. Power exists to give those with power more power. For the common man, justice is a pipe dream. Because unless you can afford to bribe the judge and pay off the politicians, you'll never see it. War is the natural state of mankind. Peace is the exception. And as Western society deteriorates, we should expect injustice, tyranny, and corruption to become more and more common. Power given to correct injustices will lead to further injustice. Actions taken to curb corruption will lead to deeper corruption. Why is that? It's because, friends, the world does not know what justice is. Because justice is from God. I'll say that again. The world does not know what justice is because justice is from God. And so if you're looking for the world to provide justice, you will be disappointed. If you look to human reason apart from the Word of God to provide justice, you only find injustice. Those who reject the Word and precepts of God cannot enact what is truly just and equitable. So take the actions of Progressive capitals like Detroit and Seattle, New York and New Orleans. Places where in their effort to fight racial injustice, they have de uh, defunded and disempowered the police force. What has happened to the social fabric, the rule of law and the exercise of justice in those places? Is New Orleans safer now that politicians are prioritizing equity, inclusiveness, and justice? Well, why not? It's because justice is from God. And those who do not know God cannot pursue justice. And so as we depart from the Christian biblical foundations of equity and justice, society will devolve further into inequity and injustice, despite the best laid plans of well-intentioned politicians. This is not to rail against those demonic liberals out there. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying everybody who tries to pursue justice apart from God's Word, conservatives too, will only enact injustice. Even Christians don't have a great track record of pursuing justice and enacting justice in our world. We are often just as blind to the injustices and corruptions of our society as our nominal and unbelieving and atheistic neighbors. Why else was race-based chattel slavery embraced and even defended among Christians for hundreds of years by some of our Reformed and Presbyterian forefathers? Why were some sectors of Christian society vehemently opposed to slavery while others vehemently defended it? It's because of this. 
even as Christians who have God's Word. We can only see the injustices and corruption that our culture will allow us to see. If you see the socially correct injustices, you will be praised. You will be recognized. But if you see the socially incorrect injustices, you will be vilified. As somebody who is threatening the fabric and integrity of society. There is great social pressure to see the correct injustices and ignore the inconvenient, I should say the convenient injustices, the injustices that work on our behalf. The point is this, no human person or human society or human government can provide the world with the justice it needs. No human person, society, or government can provide you with the justice that your heart cries for. Because justice is from God. Talk to anyone who has had to file a criminal lawsuit or press criminal charges and had to wade through that whole process. How many of you who have had to do that felt like justice was truly served at the end of it? Justice in this world is never satisfying. So we need a higher justice The only refuge we have is God's justice. And unless we know God's justice, we cannot define justice for our society. Unless we know God's justice, we will only be able to see the injustices that we want to see. And unless we know God's justice, the injustices of this world will be too great for us to bear. And the corruption and cruelty and wickedness of our world will crush us in spirit, if not in body. So let's look at Psalm 7 now with these thoughts in mind. And here's the core question I want to ask together. How do we pray to a God of justice? How do we pray to a God of justice? How do we pray according to? to and in line with God's justice, not just for his mercy out of justice, not just to avert his justice, but asking for it, longing for it. In Psalm 7, we see these four concepts, and these are our four points. First, we embrace God's justice. Second, we call upon God's justice. Third, we recognize God's justice. And fourth, we thank God for His justice. First, we embrace God's justice. Then we call upon God's justice. We recognize God's justice. And we thank God for His justice. Psalm 7 is written in a specific context That context is concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. Now, we don't know who Cush was, what he said, or when this happened. This is a reference to something that we have nowhere in the pages of Scripture. But we do see two men of Benjamin in 2 Samuel 16 and 20 cursing David because he took the throne from Saul. Benjamin was the tribe of Saul. And people from Benjamin tended not to like David because he was responsible for ousting their homeboy. My best guess is that Cush probably accused David of being a traitor and a generally disloyal scumbag sometime during the days of Saul's campaign against David, while Saul was pursuing David to put him to death. Maybe Cush was even a grima worm tongue in Saul's ear, a whisperer of lies and accusations. 
Now, here's my reasoning. In in verse 1, David speaks of being pursued and torn apart by lions. There's evidence to suggest that Saul called either his army or his elite guard his lion warriors, the lion troop. And at the very least, David is being pursued in some sense. His life is in real danger of the sword. Then David says in verse 3, if I have done this, if there is wrong or iniquity in my hands, if I've repaid my friend with evil, that is, the one who kept peace with me, or plundered my enemy without cause, that is, ripped off the one who was hostile to me, then, then let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Now, by saying, if I have done this, David is suggesting, the text is suggesting that there is a specific accusation on David's mind. Likewise, by saying, if I have repaid my friend with evil, suggests that there is an accusation of treachery, disloyalty, maybe even treason behind this psalm. So a scenario in which accusations of treason have been whispered into Saul's ear makes for a nearly ideal reconstruction of the scenario. But look at what David does in this context where he has been accused of treason, treachery, and and so his life is in danger. Look what he does. Yeah, he asks for deliverance, and yeah, he will cry for God's justice against his enemies in a moment. But here, in the opening section of the psalm, David prays this prayer against himself. He says, if I have done this thing, if I have really done what these people are saying, they'll let my enemies catch me and kill me and bury my glory in the dust. Think about that. What is, what is David saying here? Well, In one sense, David is expressing his innocence of these particular charges by hyperbole. Dale Ralph Davis says, David is using a curse formula as a way of asserting his innocence of the charges, as a way of emphatically denying that any wrong or action, wrong action or hostility on his part has brought on this enmity. He is not claiming an across-the-board perfection. He is simply claiming to be clear of the responsibility for this bit of trouble. But I think to leave it at that is to miss something desperately important. Because personally, I think David means what he is saying here. I think he genuinely believes that if the accusations are true, he deserves to die. And he's willing to accept that judgment. To prove this point... I want to ask you a simple question. How better off would the Christian church be if pastors who are accused of misconduct, of error, of abuse, if if they started by saying, if what they're saying about me is true, then I shouldn't be a pastor. How better off would the church be if men who are accused of spiritual abuse or misconduct or error or heresy and false teaching, if they started by saying, if what people are saying about me is true, then I shouldn't be a pastor anymore. But that's not what happens, is it? Now, rather we see pastors stand up and make videos, and give vague apologies and acknowledgments, but but they admit to nothing specific. Their apologies are are PR campaign, where the whole church and the pastor himself is trying to protect his position so he can come back to it if things prove untrue. They're doing damage control. And then afterwards, after some time has gone by, they're they're quickly ushered back into ministry and avoid any real accountability. They're restored far too quick. Rather than saying, if I did this, 
I shouldn't be in ministry. There, there's something of a take the log out of your own eye example here. Before crying to God for justice and for victory over our accusers, we should say, God, judge me first. See if there is any grievous, sinful way in me. Search me, O oh God, and try my heart and declare your justice over me. As Christians, and we who are Christian leaders in particular, we need to have an intolerance for corruption, misconduct, and injustice in ourselves. And we need to be willing to utter an imprecatory curse against ourselves before we try to justify ourselves. Only then can we in good conscience move on to call for justice. That's our second point. In verses 6 through 10, David summons God to his defense in an alternating pattern. He asks God to direct his fury against the wickedness of his enemies, and then he asks God to vindicate his own righteousness and integrity. Rinse and repeat. In verse 6, he says, Arise, O Yahweh, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. In verse 8, he says, Yahweh judges the people. Judge me, Yahweh, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is within me. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. Now, I don't think David is claiming to be perfectly righteous here. That is utterly incongruous with everything that we know about David and of his walk before the Lord. Rather, he is stating his uprightness and integrity in the current situation. James Montgomery Boyce writes, the question is not whether David was morally perfect, but whether he was innocent of this particular slander. And he was. David was known for his integrity and for his generous conduct toward enemies in particular. Besides, David has already asked God to bear down injustice upon him if he's guilty. And so, because David is willing to accept God's judgment if he has been treacherous and corrupt, he is now able to appeal to God's justice for doing what is right and for his integrity. David is a man of self-reflection. He knows and examines his heart. He knows and examines his intentions. He knows and examines his actions. Therefore, as far as he knows, he has been walking in righteousness and integrity. And so he prays for God to reward his integrity. He prays that God would let the truth about him prevail over slanders and lies, and that God would exercise his wrath and fury against those who are making slanderous, life-threatening accusations against him. But what about that? How are we to process David's prayer for God's wrath and fury against his enemies? How can a Christian pray that? Aren't we supposed to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us? Isn't that what Jesus says? Well, what does it mean to love your enemies? How would you define that? What should you be praying for those who persecute you? Is it loving? Is it appropriate to pray that God would bring their injustice and corruption and wickedness and slander to an end? Is it? Is it godly to pray that God would bring the wickedness and slander of evil people to an end? Yes! Yes, it is. 
All of Scripture tells the same story and has the same moral outlook. If Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you, then Jesus meant at the very least that you should be praying, Psalm 7, for those who persecute you. If we say Jesus takes Psalm 7 off the table, then we are creating a division in God's Word. We're saying that the way that God wants us to pray has changed in the New Testament. Which means that God has changed in the New Testament. Which means that God is not the same yesterday, today, and forever. Besides, how do you think God feels when he looks at a world full of wickedness and injustice and evil? Does he like it? Does he tolerate it? Is he nice towards it? Is he kind with it? No. Look at what David says here in verse 11. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. Friends, God is an angry God. And sinners fall into the hands of an angry God every day. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What then ought you to feel about the injustice and the carnage and the corruption and destruction that is wrought in this world by destructive, wicked, selfish, corrupt, reprehensible human beings? You ought to be outraged You ought to be outraged. The Burmese army used to regularly use Christian women and children as human minesweepers. African guerrilla armies kill parents and abduct their children to serve as child soldiers. Sometimes they're made to kill their own parents. They're taught cruelty. They're taught that the rule of the world is kill or be killed. Young girls and and boys are lured by strangers on the internet. By people who get into kids' video games to chat with them. And and they they encourage these boys and girls to leave their homes and leave their parents unannounced And they are abducted to serve as child prostitutes in the sex slave trade. Gangs and drug lords secure their hold on areas by executing more and more gruesome and extreme forms of violence. And these are just some examples. Every hour of every day, People suffer gross cruelty, gross injustice. And many of them are our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is often Christians who receive the basest and cruelest and most terrible hatred that our world can offer. Friends, if God does not desire justice, if he does not hate these evils, then what hope is there? What comfort is there? Again, this is the natural state of the world. War, murder, kidnapping, abuse, rape. This is the way the rest of the world is, and it is terrible. Don't be deceived by your first world problems. The rest of the world is really, really bad, you guys. As Ralph Davis writes, there is a time coming when God will put things right. If that is not the case, are we not led to despair? God expresses anger every day. There are loads of people who will say that is not or cannot be true. But if you say that, if you say that God is not like that, 
then you take away any hope that his wronged and suffering people have. You tell them that God does not care. So yes, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you and pray that they wouldn't be able to do it any longer. Third, we recognize God's justice. If we embrace God's justice against our own potential for corruption and we pray for God's justice against the world's corruption, where do we go from there? Where does David go from there? Well, in the midst of all of David's prayers and in, in his particular situation, David sees the bigger picture of God's justice at work in the world. And we'll speed through three observations on this point quickly. So here's, here's a third point with three subpoints. First, he sees that God's justice and judgment are over all over all nations and over all peoples. In verses 6 through 8, he writes, You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it, return on high. Yahweh judges the peoples. In 11 through 12, he writes, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. As as David reflects upon God's justice, he recognizes that a day is coming when all the injustice and corruption and evil in the world will be brought to an end. He is saying in these verses, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The world is awful. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. The knowledge of God's character and God's plan to set everything right in the future is what enables him to pray so boldly for justice in the present. If God is not going to judge the wickedness and injustice of the world, then what hope is there? If God is not going to judge all people, but only his people, then what comfort is there? The only comfort we have in a sin-sick, unjust, and cruel world is that one day God will make everything right for everybody. Not just in some places, but everywhere. That God exercises his reign and his authority and his judgment seat will be over every nation on earth and every person inside every nation on earth. He will punish all wickedness in a fury of much deserved wrath. Second, David sees that God's justice is not merely for his own benefit, but for all of God's people, for all of the righteous. This is your second subpoint. Verses 9 and 10 say, O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. As David considers his own plight, he, his mind goes to the broader, the larger people of God, all of those who are righteous by faith in God, who are walking according to his ways and seeking his word. He thinks about the persecuted church, as it were. Even so, when we have our complaints, when we see injustice personally or in our society or on the evening news or it affects somebody that we know, when we see injustice on the small scale, God's word calls us to remember that our brothers and sisters in Christ are experiencing much the same things all the world over and they'll They'll never see the evening news. We have brothers and sisters in Christ who are experiencing greater injustice than anything you and I will ever experience by God's grace to us. We have a tendency to magnify our own problems as the most pressing, most serious problems they are because they're the ones that we feel. But when we suffer and when we should when we pray, we should remember those who suffer like us and pray for them too. We should lift them up in our prayers. 
Because we don't suffer alone, but with all of Christ's body. So 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9 say, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And thirdly, David sees that God's justice is currently at work in the world. It's just sometimes hard to recognize. We see this in verses 14 through 16. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. In these Verses, David recognizes that not only will justice be done in the end, but God has a way of executing his justice on the wicked in the present world. The world calls this karma. Jesus says you reap what you sow. The world says it's an impersonal force of an impersonal universe. The Bible says it's a personal providence based on a just God. Even when it it seems like the wicked and corrupt are having an easy go at life, the Bible says that their injustice, their corruption, their wickedness, their selfishness will be brought back on their own heads. They will fall into the pit that they have dug for other people. They will be hanged on the gallows that they prepared for the righteous. If you sow injustice, you will be caught in the thorns that you have planted, in the snare that you have set. This is how the world works. This is how God's ordinary justice operates in the present. It's just not very quick. God is patient. He gives people time to repent, and wickedness itself has a gestation period. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. Unfortunately, what this means is that God, in his sovereignty, in his common grace, he often gives wicked people more time to do terrible things. In the mysteries of his providence, because he is patient, because he is gracious, and because wickedness has a gestation period, he often gives wicked, evil people more time to do evil, wicked things. And that frustrates the heck out of us. But we must remember that When we see evil people allowed to continue doing evil things, it's not because God is inactive. Rather, two things are happening. He is allowing them to set their own trap, and he is allowing them to store up wrath for themselves on the day of final judgment because of their hard and impenitent hearts. That brings us to the final point, the final main point. We thank God for His justice. This point, like the verse we see it in, is short and to the point. David ends by saying, I will give to Yahweh the thanks due to His righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of Yahweh, the Most High. Even so, when we're wrestling with the injustices that we see in the world, we need to remember God's character and God's actions. We need to remember who He is and what He has done alongside what He will do. And in this, we need to remember to give God thanks. Why? Because God is righteous and just. And His decrees are upright and just. And He executes righteousness and justice. He is the most high God, the creator God, the judge of all the earth. And as Abraham says, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And hasn't God shown you his justice 
And hasn't it rejoiced your heart? Hasn't He made known to you His righteousness? Hasn't He come to your defense, to your aid, and turned the evil of the enemy of Satan into a cause for your thanksgiving and praise? Hasn't He taken your sin and wickedness and condemned them in Christ and given you a new life in Him? Do you realize that it is because of His justice that the old you is dead? And that sin no longer has dominion over you. That's not just God's mercy. That's God's justice. Hasn't he revealed his righteousness to you in Christ apart from the law, although although the law and the prophets testified to it? This is the righteousness of God that comes by faith in Christ Jesus. Don't you know that being declared righteous in Christ is an exercise of God's justice? Hasn't he dealt justly with some pretty awful people in your life? Delivering you from abusive leaders, authorities, bosses, and relationships. Haven't you seen God deliver your friends and loved ones from Similar people, maybe the same people in different ways, while he allows these wicked people to continue working to their own destruction. And you wonder why, but you're thankful that you're out of it. And you're thankful that people you love are out of it. Friends, how has God demonstrated his righteousness and justice in your life? How has he shown you that his righteousness is right? That his timing is perfect, perfect. That the suffering he allows is not forever. That he will not allow you or his people to suffer unjustly forever. I've seen it. Haven't you? Now, as we conclude, I want to leave you with this. One of the reasons I think many of us struggle with anger issues and anxiety issues and depression issues and incredible uncontrollable frustration with the state of our world. I think one of the reasons for all that is one simple fact. We don't know how to give our anxiety and frustration to God. Because we've lost the knowledge of how to pray Psalm 7. We don't know how to give our stress to Him. We don't know how to call upon God for justice. We feel like we're not supposed to pray to God for justice. We feel like it's unchristian. So we continue shouldering the burdens that we see in the world rather than giving them to God. We don't know how to hand vengeance over to God, and so we carry in our hearts a longing for vengeance. It's it's one of those paradoxes of biblical Christianity that in order to be able to forgive and love the unlovely, you have to give your hatred for that person to God. In order to be gracious... You have to cry for justice. That's how God is gracious to you. The only reason God is gracious to you is because he exercised justice on Jesus. Take Philippians 4, 6 through 7, which says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, this is exactly what we see David doing in Psalm 7. Philippians 4, 6 is Psalm 7. He's anxious. He's stressed out. And so... In prayer and with supplication, with thanksgiving, he makes his desperate requests made known to God. And the peace of God rules David's heart. The reason David could 
leave Saul alive, could refuse to strike against the Lord's anointed, is because he entrusted his anger and his desire for justice to the God who says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. The reason he was able to to stay his hand against Nabal, the husband of Abigail, was because Abigail reminded him that God is the one who owns vengeance. And so David was able to stay his hand. And then God exercised vengeance in David's honor. While it may seem that Psalm 7 is harsh, and we may ask, how can a Christian pray that, pray that way? I want to suggest to you that it is only by learning to pray this way that we can maintain a loving and gracious, a loving and gracious, loving and gracious Christian witness in an unjust and cruel world. If we don't hand our anger our desire for justice to him, then we will try to manufacture justice ourselves and we'll make the problem worse. When you've been falsely accused and you stand up in your own defense, does that usually make the matter better or worse? To be loving and gracious to our enemies, to desire God's mercy for those who wrong us, we must entrust God, justice to God's hands. We have to fully hand our case over to God and entrust Him to be our prosecutor and our judge. Thank you for listening to this sermon from River Community Church in Prairieville, Louisiana, where you will always find biblical preaching, meaningful worship, and the equipping of disciples. For more information on River Community Church and its ministries, please visit rivercommunity.org.